you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Genesis chapter number 15. I normally, uh, first sermon of the year, do kind of a state of the church address. I'm not going to do that this year. But uh, I do have uh, something the Lord's been leading me to uh, want to talk about. And uh, we're going to start hopefully what will be 15 weeks to uh, talk about this. So um, I want to talk about what it means to believe. In the Gospel of John, John wrote more times than anyone else in uh, all of Scripture. He used the word believe. He used the word believe. Um, you know, John wrote his script, his, his Gospel late. He was uh, with the Lord. He uh, walked with him. He was one of the disciples that became one of the apostles. And uh, God did a uh, mighty things in John's life, and John got to see it all. He got to see Christ up close. He got to see the miracles. He got to hear the sermons. He got to hear him pray. They could ask questions. I mean, uh, he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus when the glory of God was there. What an awesome thing to have all those experiences. And you would have thought that he would have wanted to go and write them down just as quickly as possible, but uh, under the leadership of the Lord, he didn't do that. Matter of fact, it was probably about 60 years after the crucifixion and the resurrection that the Holy Spirit, okay, now it's time to write it. But in the last chapter, actually the next to last chapter, he actually gave the reason that he wrote his gospel, the gospel of John. And it says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you may have life in his name. He said, the reason I'm writing this is so that you can believe that this Jesus, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's God's gift for us. And that by believing in it, you, you, you can have life in his name. He remembered, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he remembered when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He remembers the conversation when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and said, for God so loved the world. Y'all know this verse? That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John knew that the life that, that the Holy Spirit was talking about that would give us access to God was about believing in Jesus. Matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, he says it 18 times, the word believe, believer, or believing. He wanted everyone to know that believing is what it's all about. Now, many people will say, well, yeah, I, I believe in God. And some will say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But understand James 2.9 says the demons believe those things and even tremble. They were created by God too, so they knew he existed. And they were actually in the presence of Jesus. But because of their unbelief, they became fallen from what God created them to be. The other angels who stayed in belief, they fulfilled what God created in them. I'm here to tell you, we're going to talk a lot about this, and I want you to get this. We were created to give God glory, and we do that by how we believe in Him, how we trust in Him, how we walk with Him, how we obey Him. That's the magic of it right there, is by having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk a lot about what it means to believe in Jesus. I believe that's one of the foundational questions of, of what it means to be a Christian. I have a friend of mine. He was on staff for me for about 10 years. And he was really one of the very first ones that I ever heard say that. And I, I've kind of made it my own. When, when he was talking about a Christian, someone who had a relationship with Jesus, he would say, now that's a believer right there. And I thought, you know, that's a good thing. We need to be known as believers, we need to be known as the people that in our life we are choosing to obey God, 
to walk with God and to believe in Him. That's the reason why we're going to take about probably about 15 weeks, but it's not going to be a doctrinal study. We're not going to do that. I've got at, at home, I've got books and books and books uh, of what it, they'll say, now this is what it means to believe. And they're going to talk about Christology and pneumatology and serotology. I, I don't care about all the ologies, right? There's a lot of that stuff that we say that we believe up here, but it never gets out of our head and into our heart and into our feet, right? If we believe it, we need to live it. How many of us know that there's more of this that we, are, that we believe than we're living? And my question is this, if we believe it, why aren't we living it? We need a fresh breath of God to come and to take us and, and to move us into what we could be. So if you have your Bibles in Genesis chapter 15, would you stand up with me in honor of God's Word? Are you there? Say amen. amen. If not, just follow us on the screen, right? Genesis chapter 15, verse number 1. God's Word says this, After these things, the Word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. God knew how to speak to him. God speaks in many different ways. But the key is, is that God had a word for him, and he spoke to him saying, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Just remember that when we have God, you don't need to fear. Over the last two years, we've been taught a lot about fear. And they've been telling us this, and they've been telling us that. And we, we actually, through personal experience, I've done uh, funerals for people that have had COVID, but I've actually been, people have gotten on to me because uh, they, I, I say faith overcomes fear. And they say, oh, no, we, we need to be fearful. Well, hold on. God's Word says we're not supposed to be fearful. Now, we're supposed to be wise, right? But, but God never says to fear. And when, when the angels came down and, and spoke to the, the shepherds, the first thing they said to them was, do not fear. When Gabriel spoke to, to Mary or the time that he spoke to Joseph, the very first thing, he said, don't fear, Right? If we believe that there is a God, we need to understand that they, if we have a relationship with him, he can take care of us, right? So, they, so he says to Abram, do not be afraid. I am, your, mm, I am your exceedingly great reward. You may not feel it right now, but I got blessings for you. I got words for you. I got promises for you. And by the way, the light shines the brightest in dark places. Quit waiting for it to become bright. Become a reflector of God's light. We need to soak it all in. So look what he says here in verse number five. I love this. Verse number five. Then he brought him outside and said, look now towards heaven. Count the stars if you were able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Look up. See the stars. Count them if you can. So shall your descendants be. And then that powerful verse, verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that we hear a word from you. Father, if they hear a word from me, they're going to leave hungry. But Lord, we invite you to come and speak. We are eager to hear from you. Whisper from your wisdom, from your heart of love to our hearts that is so fashioned to be filled by you. Lord, may we quit worrying, fretting, May we quit finding our wisdom by the ways of the world and look unto you. Your promises are there. You are our reward. So today, speak fresh. We want a fresh drink of the thirst-quenching waters of who you are. Father, you have a reason and a purpose for us to be here. Let us hear from you. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Soren Kierkegaard made a statement that I want to share with you, and I quote him. He says, if I were to wish for anything, I would not wish for wealth and power. I wonder how many people today, if they were given a wish, they would wish for that. All the wealth that they wanted, more than what they needed. All the power to do whatever they wanted to do. But he said in his quote, If I could wish for anything, I should not wish for wealth and power, but for the passionate sense of what can be. For the eye which ever young and ardent sees the possible. He says, if I had my, my choice, what I would wish for is for a passionate ability to see the possibilities. Here, and I quote from him, he says, pleasure disappoints, but possibility never. There's so many things that people are living their life for that are really not going to be a blessing. Faith begins where sight will never take you. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, Solomon repeats it in chapter 16, verse 25, when he says this, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way, it seems right, but the end will lead to death. Now that doesn't say that everything that seems right to you will lead you to death. Some things that seem right to you will be blessing. That's a good thing. And not everything that you don't understand is wrong. Some things that you don't understand may be right. So maybe you need a greater understanding here. But he says there is a way. There, is, there are times that we look at things and we're absolutely convinced. There is a way that we're living that we, we think this is exactly right, but it will take you to the wrong place. Solomon should have known that. There were some things that he did in his life that took him definitely to the wrong place. Proverbs 3 says this, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. I think we can all agree that there are things that we could trust in that are not going to bless, but we can also always trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your understanding, all your abilities, he says. Then he says, lean not into your own understanding. That's kind of saying what he said in the 14th chapter and the 16th chapter, when he says there is a way that seems right. He said, hey, trust in the Lord, but don't lean into your own understanding. Your own understanding may let you down. Right? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Hold on, there's a word there we need to see. In all your ways, Acknowledge God, and he'll direct your path. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That word way there means a path. In our building today, we've got an aisle down here, and if you were going to move from that side of the church to this side of the church, you would probably not jump over all the pews or crawl under the pews or all that. You'd probably take the easy path, that's the path that everybody goes. Are you there? You understand what I'm saying? And, and you can look in the carpet, and you, it, it's almost a different color than it is underneath the pews. Because you see, the, we don't walk on that underneath the pews, and it looks fresh. But these well-worn paths can get worn out. When I was a kid, we lived on this road called 1512 Riverbend Road. I was four years old, five years old. I still remember the address. I still remember my phone number I had when I was five years old. And, and my dad pastored a church, and we lived on one street, and the, the, the house faced this direction, and the church was on a different street and faced in a different direction. But there was a, a path from the back of the house that went to the back of the church. And if you were looking at it, there was, it was a very visible path. There was no grass growing there. 
because we walk that same path all the time. All the time we go from one place to the next and we would walk that path. Now, we could have taken any route we wanted to. We could have went over there one day and went over there one day. But for some reason, we followed the same, come on now, routine. And it usually is the one that makes sense to us, and it's usually the shortest. And we're very comfortable following that path. This word way there means a well-worn path. That, that path from the back of the house over to the, the church, there wasn't any grass that grew there at all. I mean, it was just packed down hard. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever have one of those paths? And, and if you're not careful, our life can be that way. You, you're going to get up and you're going to follow a routine. And when you see people, you're going to talk about sometimes the same things you always talk about with them. What are you going to do today? Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do today. Well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to every day. And we do those things. There are people who go to work and do the same things every day at work. Every day at work. And they've got a, a dullness that will come from that. But you see, there are also some ways that we think that we think for a long period of time, maybe our parents taught us something, maybe a teacher in school, maybe we read it somewhere, maybe it was just, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way people do things. You know, mom always said, daddy said you're supposed to, whatever it may be. And, and that becomes a way that you do things, right? And that may become a way that seems right into you. Y'all look up at me. That's okay, as long as it agrees with God. Well, what about all the areas in our life that God might not agree with? What about all the areas in our life where God's not fresh there? I want God to be the Lord of all my life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't look at it the way you look at it. Don't lean into your own understanding. But in all your ways, all those well-worn paths, acknowledge him. And he will lead your way. He will lead your path. You see, what we've got to do is we've got to look at everything that we do and, and understand why it is God wants you there. And do you see them there? And are you trusting him there? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Are you trusting him there? Are you believing in that? I'm not going to talk about trust today. Uh, it's probably going to take me five sermons to, to, to just get a, a little bit of what it means to trust in the Lord. But we should want to trust in God in every aspect of our life. Every aspect. Take your Bible and look in Genesis 12. I, I just want to look there real quickly for just a moment. In Genesis 12, verse 1 now the Lord said to Abram, doesn't tell how he spoke to him, but God had a word for him, and God made it, made it where he could understand him. And he spoke to Abram. This is what he said. Get out of your country, from your family, get away from your family, from your father's house, you're going to have to walk away from everything that you've known, to a land that I will show you. By the way, Abram, I will make you a great nation. I wonder what Abraham's felt like in his heart when he heard those words from the Lord. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Listen, Abraham doesn't even have a desire to pray this prayer. This is so outlandish that he would never even think of praying this prayer. But, but God is saying it to him. It's a promise. He said, I will make you a blessing. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. If the people treat you well, I'll bless them. People treat you badly, I will curse them. Listen to this. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The only problem was he was going to have to leave everything behind. Come on, church. 75 years old. And God said, leave it behind. Everything that he had known, everything that he had built, 
everything that he had trusted in. You may say, Pastor, where are you going at? I'm telling you that we learn how to live our lives the way we want, but we need to learn to live our lives the way God wants. We're very comfortable doing what we want, but we get uncomfortable if God asks us to do something we're not comfortable with, following a different path. But I'm here to tell you, God wants to move us from where we are to where we need to be. And I don't care how old you are. Emily, I don't care how young you are. We've always got time to be what God wanted us to be. Don't use excuses. Don't say that time's past. This is 2022. This is a new year. It's a new time to look at it. What can God do? What does God want to do? Today. Are you ready to hear from him today? And if you do, are you ready to act upon it? Abram had to begin with just flat out obedience that didn't make sense. And God wasn't willing to say anything more than I will bless you, but you've got to move from where you are to the place that I'm going to lead you. Are you ready today for such a journey? That God is will lead you. We can't downplay this. This was a massive movement on his life. Look what it says in chapter 15. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. I will be with you. Now, the, that, it's amazing to me that he says this to Abram in chapter 15. The very first thing he says is, I, do, do not be afraid. He just came from a war. Circumstances came up, and he was obedient. And God was with him. Lot got himself in trouble. And an enemy came in and, and took Lot. And by the way, took the, the, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah too. And took them off. And Abram got his 300 and I think 18 people. And they got up and they just went after them, his servants. And, and they defeated them. And Abram met Melchizedek there. That he may not have ever met Melchizedek if he hadn't gone through those circumstances. Come on now. There's a lot of circumstances that we've gone through in the last two years that we didn't want, that we don't understand. Someone told me this morning, before the first service, they said, they said, Preacher, I, I, I love what you wrote in the newsletter. And I thought, praise God, we had somebody read the newsletter. Amen. And they even liked it. And they even remember what I said there. And uh, they actually took it and, and sent it on to other people so that other people could, could see it too. And I thought, well, amen, praise God, hallelujah, right? But I talked about the seasons. And I said, we go through different seasons. Look, we've gone through a season over the last two years. We weren't looking for this. We weren't expecting this. And if we had our way, we would have done things different. But God knows what he's doing. And he knows how to get us from where we are to where we need to be. And we need to quit complaining and griping about if we could just change all the circumstances, then God could get glory and honor. God wants to change the circumstances in us. He's not worried about the circumstances of the world. He is on the throne in glory, and it looks good from his advantage point. And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think in our minds, all that we could ask through prayers. He's that kind of a God. I just wonder if he wanted to, could he use us? Don't be afraid. The reward that we have is not waiting for us in heaven. It's going to be good, but he's already placed it in our hearts down here. I have the reward. So many people don't have happiness because God has not defined the goal the way they wanted it yet. And they're looking for God to bring them the success that they want rather than just listening and being obedient to God. We call this inverted Christianity. Inverted Christianity. Inver inverted Christianity says this. Instead of following the Spirit, we want the Spirit to follow us. Instead of asking the Spirit to lead us and guide us and us joining Him, we want Him to join us. Instead of serving God's purposes, we want God to serve our purposes. 
Instead of doing what makes God happy, we want God to do what makes us happy. Why would God ever do that? God's got something else planned for us. Look in verse number 5, Genesis 15, verse 5. This is so cool. I love this. Look what it says. Then God brought him outside. Where was he? He was in his tent. Abraham had a tent. He lived in tents. God would lead him someplace, and as he'd get there, he'd set up his tent. He'd go in there, and he'd be in his tent at night. God said, uh, I need you to see something. Now, hold on. For him to see something, he had to get outside. So he goes outside in verse 5. Look what it says. He brought him outside and said, look now towards heaven. Look up, Abram. I wonder if it was a dark night. I wonder if the stars were twinkling. You ever been out on a high place late at night, away from all the artificial lights that we have, the, the hat lights from the houses and the lights from the, away from the street lights and away, away maybe from a, a campfire or something like that? Real dark. You get out, you look up, and the stars are just, it's like they got plugged in. Hold on. They were always there, right? But during the day, you can't see them. When the sun's shining down here, we're, 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 we're walking out that well-worn path, and we, we don't see it. We're, we're too busy doing other things. But at nighttime, God says, come outside. Look up. Look what it says. Look now towards heaven. Count the stars if you are able to number them. Can't you see Abram? Okay. One, two, three, 27, 28. Oh, I lost count. Let me, let me start over. Could you imagine just laying out there at night and looking up trying to count the stars? It wouldn't take long, and you would say, Lord, this is impossible. There's just too many. Look what he said. So shall your descendants be. Hold on. In verse 1, he said, don't be afraid. I'm your reward. Abram says, all right, God, I got this. Back in chapter 12, you told me I had to leave home, that you were going to make me a mighty nation. I don't have an heir. My servant, if I died, everything's going to go to my servant. He would be my heir. Neighbors, God says, no, no, no. Come out here and look. You see these? So shall your descendants be. Count them. Can you count them? The promises of God. The problem was, was that Abraham had been living inside a tent that had a, what, a seven, eight, ten-foot ceiling? He couldn't see the possibilities. That's what Kierkegaard was talking about. He did, if he had a prayer request, it wouldn't be for wealth and power. It would be to see the possibilities. What could God do? What does God want to do? What are the possibilities? What could God do with you this year? How could God bless with you this year? Are you hungry for joy? But maybe the joy that you found is fleeting. Are you looking for peace? I mean, peace can come from a word from Christ. He can say, peace be still, and everything would quieten down. Those disciples that were with him on the lake that day when the storm came and he just spoke the word and peace came. But listen, with life, more storms came. Do you lose your peace? Are you serving? Are you believing? Are you trusting? Or are you just following that well-worn path of life, doing things the way you feel like it's right, but you're very comfortable with it, you're all right, just... Tracking time, waiting to go to heaven one day. God wants us to live for more than that. And it says in verse 6 
that he believed in the Lord. That's the money quote right there. He believed him. And because he believed him, God saw his heart and said, now you're righteous. Now I can work. Now I can do great things. You know what God wants to do in your life? He wants you to believe. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your life, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I love how the New American Standard says, it is your reasonable act of worship. Don't be conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. How many of us have been taught by this world how to do it? What we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, what we can do. That the world wants to come and put a ceiling over us. I tell you in everything that we do. How we do church. Well, preacher, I, I think we could do that. I'm not sure we could do that. We're leaning under our own understanding. And I hear everybody, they, everybody's got advice and everybody wants to tell you how to do it God's way. But they're not listening for God to tell you how to do it God's way. Oh, I was a part of something one time and, and I just wish we could get back to that. That's the very same phrase the children of Israel were saying in the wilderness when they wanted to go back to slavery in Egypt. That's the exact same thing when God said, I've got so much more promised for you. As a matter of fact, he would go on in Abram's life to even tell them that. Your descendants, you're going to have descendants. They're going to come from your own body. But they will be taken to a, a huge place and they will, they will not even want to be there. But understand, four generations, I'll bring them back. He even knew the circumstances, but he said, still believe me. Trust me, I've got a plan. How do we move from where we are to where we need to be? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've got to change our thinking. I don't know all that God wants to do, but I can tell you this. He doesn't want us to follow inverted Christianity. He wants us to become living, believing followers of Christ. I don't just go, I don't choose sermons, just kind of go, hey, that's a good one, I like that, I think I'll preach that today. You pray it out and you just kind of see what God wants to do. And what God has taught me, I think is kind of what he told John in the Gospel of John, what people need is to believe. Fresh and new. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean into your own understandings. But in all your ways, that well-worn path, acknowledge Him. He'll direct your path. I don't know what's going to come in 22. I don't know. Maybe more of what we faced in 2021. I don't know. I really don't really care about the circumstances. I mean, Jesus sent his disciples into places that he knew were going to be hard circumstances, but yet he still sent them there. As a matter of fact, when he ascended back to heaven and he sent the Spirit to his disciples and, and the church was formed, it was out of some of the most hard circumstances that the church grew. So maybe, I don't know, maybe circumstances will get better. Maybe they'll get worse. I don't know. But I can tell you that either way, we need to be believing in him.